This video is the second in a series exploring the trial and death of Socrates, as told by Plato's dialogues. Don't worry if you missed the first video, but consider checking it out afterwards. Links in the description. As we discussed in the previous video, Socrates was famously sentenced to death after being charged with impiety and corrupting the youth, but he would have to wait a month in jail before he would drink the poisonous hemlock. His trial happened to occur the day after the Athenian state galley set off on its annual religious mission to the island of Delos, and no executions were permitted while it was away. In the meantime, a rich friend of Socrates, Credo, made a visit to him in jail and made one last effort to convince him to allow his friends to save him by bribing the guards and helping him escape to another city. Credo argues that this is just what a good friend would do, and that anyone would expect to be saved by their friends. And yet, Socrates disagrees with him, and doesn't allow himself to be rescued, arguing that two wrongs don't make a right. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're discussing Plato's dialogue, the Credo, which depicts one of the final days in the life of Socrates. By arguing for the laws of his city, and not allowing Credo to break him out of jail, he not only stays true to his ideals, but also provides an early version of social contract theory. Socrates argues that, because of the benefits that one gains by being a citizen of a city, they are essentially a slave to the city's laws, and to go against your city would be worse than attacking your own parents. But we'll see that, like most dialogues, there are some unresolved questions at the end, and the reader is left to reflect on the issues of justice, which remain unanswered. But before we get into it, want more videos about ancient philosophy? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. Anyways, let's get into it. In the complete works of Plato, the editor John M. Cooper introduces this dialogue by saying that Credo's arguments in favor of his plan and Socrates in rejecting it are rather jumbled, as perhaps befits the pressure and excitement of the moment. Socrates seems not to hear the larger claim of injustice that Credo lodges. Credo's jumbled presentation of his case facilitates this. Socrates is unmoved by Credo's arguments and even seems to ignore some of his points. Just like in the Apology, Socrates would rather give up his life than compromise on his values. As we'll see as we explore Socrates' view on the soul, he believed that by doing wrong you were damaging your soul, which is why he famously made the contentious statement that no one does wrong knowingly. Just like you wouldn't purposely damage your own body, you wouldn't do things that damage your soul unless you were absolutely ignorant about the moral harm that was caused by wrong action. At its core, this dialogue is about some of the fundamental questions about justice. How much obligation do we have to the state? How important is it to respect the law? Is it right to respond to injustice with even more injustice? Like most of Plato's dialogues, we may not find an answer to these questions, but we can definitely explore the arguments around them. As we'll see in many dialogues, it doesn't immediately begin with philosophical arguments, but instead reads like a short story. It is early dawn, and Socrates awakens to find Credo waiting in his cell. He is surprised, not just that the guard had let him in, but also that Credo didn't immediately wake him up. Credo says that the guard is quite friendly to him by this point, and in fact has been paid off. As to why he waited some time for Socrates to wake up on his own, Credo tells him that, I would not myself want to be in distress and awake so long. I have been surprised to see you peacefully asleep. It was on purpose that I did not wake you, so that you should spend your time most agreeably. Often in the past, throughout my life, I have considered the way you live happy, and especially so now that you bear your present misfortune, so easily and lightly. Socrates tells him that it would not be fitting for a man his age to resent having to die, to which Credo replies, Other men of your age are caught in such misfortunes, but their age does not prevent them resenting their fate. That is so, Socrates says. Why have you come so early? Credo has come so early because of bad news. The state ship, which we mentioned in the introduction, was expected to arrive that day. Socrates would be executed the very next day then, but he doesn't seem to care, and says, May it be for the best. If it so please the gods, so be it. Credo makes his first argument, saying that not only will he lose a great friend, the like of whom he shall never find again, he will also gain a bad reputation, since people will think he was unwilling to spend money to save his friend. Of course, Socrates says that we shouldn't care about what the majority think, and that the most reasonable people, who are the ones actually worth paying attention to, will understand why things happened as they did. However, according to Credo, 
his present situation shows exactly why we should pay attention to the opinion of the majority, since they can inflict not the least, but pretty well the greatest evils if one is slandered among them. But Socrates says that the majority cannot inflict the greatest evils any more than they are capable of the greatest good. Credo tells Socrates that if he's worried about his friends being punished and losing their property, he shouldn't be. The risk is worth taking, and he has friends who can chip in and help out, along with other friends that would gladly welcome him in other cities and keep him safe. Besides this, Credo argues that it isn't just to give up his life when he can save it, especially when he's leaving behind sons. Doesn't he care about their fate? You seem to me to choose the easiest path, he tells Socrates, whereas one should choose the path a good and courageous man would choose, particularly when one claims throughout one's life to care for virtue. Now the dialogue truly begins, as Socrates declares that they must thoroughly examine the matter and which way they should act, since he is the kind of man who listens to nothing within himself but the argument that on reflection seems best to him. His principles haven't changed, and so he stands by the arguments he previously made in the apology for accepting the sentence. He says that the threats of the majority are only spooks, and he will not be frightened by them as if he were a child. Instead of addressing the emotion of the situation, he begins by examining Credo's first argument, asking him whose opinion should we pay attention to. Obviously we shouldn't value everyone's opinion, but certain ones in particular. For example, professional athletes should take diet and exercise advice from their trainers and doctors, not from random strangers. If they don't listen to people who know what they're talking about, the athlete risks not just harming his body, but ruining it. So we should listen to the good opinions of the wise, those who understand justice and injustice, unless we want to risk ruining our souls, according to Socrates. He says that the most important thing is not life, but the good life, and that the good life the beautiful life, and the just life are the same. Socrates disregards the questions which Credo raised about money, reputation, and the future of his children, saying that those considerations belong to the majority. He is only concerned with acting justly. And so he lays out a series of propositions which Credo affirms. They agree that not only should we never do wrong, if someone else treats us unjustly, we should not be unjust to them in return. So one must never do wrong, nor must one, when wronged, inflict wrong in return, as the majority believe. As John M. Cooper says, we hear strains of the time-honored Greek idea that justice is helping one's friends and harming one's enemies, an ideal we'll see fully examined later in the Republic. In both dialogues, he disagrees with the idea. He says that doing harm to people is no different from wrongdoing, and then moves on to a discussion about why we should keep our word and follow through on fair agreements that we've made. The question is, if we leave here without the city's permission, are we harming people whom we should least do harm to? And are we sticking to a just agreement or not? At this point, Credo is at a loss and cannot answer his questions. And so Socrates continues the dialogue by himself, acting as a personification of the laws. He defends the state and the judgment of the court, saying, look at it this way. If, as we were planning to run away from here, or whatever one should call it, the laws in the state came and confronted us and asked, Tell me, Socrates, what are you intending to do? Do you not, by this action you are attempting, intend to destroy us, the laws, and indeed the whole city, as far as you are concerned? Or do you think it possible for a city not to be destroyed, if the verdicts of its courts have no force but are nullified and set at naught by private individuals? What shall we answer to this and other such arguments? For many things could be said, especially by an orator on behalf of this law we are destroying, which orders that the judgments of the courts shall be carried out. Sure, you could say that the city wronged Socrates, or that the decision wasn't right, but just like parents and children, citizens are not equal to or above the law. The laws might say that Socrates is essentially the offspring of the city, since he was nurtured and educated by it. And so the law asks Socrates, do you think you have this right to retaliation against your city and its laws? That if we undertake to destroy you, and think it right to do so, you can undertake to destroy us, as far as you can, in return? And will you say that you are right to do so, you who truly care for virtue? Is your wisdom such as not to realize that your country is to be honored more than your mother, your father, and all your ancestors? That it is more to be revered and more sacred, and that it counts for more among the gods and sensible men that you must worship it, yield to it and placate its anger more than your fathers? You must either persuade it or obey its orders, 
and endure in silence whatever it instructs you to endure, whether blows or bonds, and if it leads you into war to be wounded or killed, you must obey. To do so is right, and one must not give way or retreat or leave one's post. But both in war and in courts and everywhere else, one must obey the commands of one's city and country or persuade it as to the nature of justice. It is impious to bring violence or bear against your mother or father. It is much more so to use it against your country. Essentially, a state cannot exist without a respect for the rule of law, and chaos would ensue if everyone had the ability to just ignore the judgments of the courts. Socrates asks Credo if he thinks the laws speak the truth or not, and Credo replies that he thinks they are right. As the laws will later go on to tell Socrates, he has not been harmed by the law, but by men. The city not only nurtured and educated Socrates, but gave him and all citizens a share of all the good things it possibly could. If the laws and affairs of the city don't please him, well then he can get out. He chose to stay, and therefore he has essentially agreed to the social contract that he will obey the city's laws and decisions. He had the opportunity to persuade his fellow citizens, or suggest the penalty of exile if he wanted to, but he didn't. And so, since he agreed, not only in words, but by his deeds as well, to live in accordance with the law, his only choice is to accept the state's decision. The last argument is, in my opinion, the best. The law tells Socrates that, if you go to one of the nearby cities, you will arrive as an enemy to their government. All who care for their city will look on you with suspicion, as a destroyer of the laws. You will also strengthen the conviction of the jury that they pass the right sentence on you, for anyone who destroys the laws could easily be thought to corrupt the young and the ignorant. Or will you avoid cities that are well governed and men who are civilized? If you do this, will your life be worth living? Will you have social intercourse with them and not be ashamed to talk to them? And what will you say, the same as you did here, that virtue and justice are man's most precious possession, along with lawful behavior and the laws? Do you not think that Socrates would appear to be an unseemly kind of person? One must think so. Be persuaded by us who have brought you up, Socrates. Do not value either your children or your life or anything else more than goodness, in order that when you arrive in Hades, you may have all this as your defense before the rulers there. The dialogue finishes with Socrates telling Credo that, just like flute music can possess a dancer, the words of the law resonate so much with him that it's all he can listen to. While his student Plato and later Aristotle would have plenty of criticism for the democracy of Athens, here Socrates shows his general respect for experts and authority, which we'll see throughout the dialogues. By arguing for loyalty to the state, Socrates gives us one of the earliest forms of a social contract theory, where citizens have a mutual agreement with the state to obey the laws and give up some personal liberty in return for the state's protection and the benefits of living in a society. In fact, David Hume said that, The only passage I meet with in antiquity, where the obligation of obedience to government is ascribed to a promise, is in Plato's Credo, where Socrates refuses to escape from prison because he had tacitly promised to obey the laws. Thus he builds a Tory consequence of passive obedience on a Whig foundation of the original social contract. There are many unasked questions here. For instance, why does remaining in a city amount to a tacit agreement to obey its laws? We didn't choose to be raised or educated by the city, so why are we indebted to the state? If there is such an agreement, does that necessarily mean we should listen to the state? What if the state is not a good representative of the law? Are there conditions under which it's justified to disobey the law? For instance, if the law itself is unjust? Some scholars think that Socrates is presented as an embarrassingly obedient and dutiful citizen in this dialogue perhaps in order to justify him to the good citizens who did not care about philosophy. On the other hand, philosopher Karl Popper believed that the representation of Socrates found here and in the Apology presents us with the most authentic version of Socrates. So what do you think? Should Socrates have escaped? Make sure to let me know in the comments below. Anyways, before I go, I want to end this video with a quote. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws, and there are unjust laws. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. This is difference made legal. 
On the other hand, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow, that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. There are some instances when a law is just on its face, but unjust in its application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now there is nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. I hope you can see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as the rabid segregationists would do. This would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do it openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the very highest respect for the law. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.